No? Okay. So um, I'm supposed to mention to you as well that there's uh, student evaluations out. Um, so if you have any questions about filling that out or anything, if you have trouble finding it, let me know. Um, yes, question? Uh, Roughly, yeah. It's, I'm still putting it together, but yeah, there's going to be more of an emphasis on the new material. Um, and then when it comes to stuff that is cumulative, it's not going to be anything is fair game. I'm going to give you like a targeted overview. Most stuff is going to be fair game, but it's not going to, in other words, I'm not going to take something that wasn't on one of the first midterms, at least a concept. Like there'll be, there'll be a magnetism questions, for example. There'll be a couple of, you know, find the force due to magnetic fields on charged particles or, so, or something like that, or wires. But there's not going to be um, circuits on the final. I'm going to leave that one off. That way you have more time to study the new material. Uh, because there's a lot going on with relativity. We're going to talk about it today so, uh, as well. So I want people to focus on that more and have more time to study for that. So that's, but also not just the relativity, but the last chapter on light. There's going to be a lot of questions on light. So study that last chapter as well. That one and relativity, both very important because we couldn't really say what we're saying about relativity without um, what we know about light and Maxwell's equations. So that, that's a very important chapter, and it will be definitely a significant amount of questions on the final. Those last two chapters that we haven't done an exam over yet, that's going to be the bulk of the final. But there will be questions not about that. Yes? Um, that's a good question. Yes, there will be some conceptual. Um, I think it's going to be more like the second midterm where there's more problems. Um, the difference is that I think I'm gonna, there's going to be a lot more time. Oh, and we're not taking it in this room. So we're all going to be in a different room. Did, did you guys see that announcement? Okay, great. It's a much bigger classroom. There's a lot more space. It seats like 300 something, I think. It's huge. But I don't know where it is exactly. I haven't been around that part of the campus yet. So I'll have to take a look. But there is like a link to it that I put on the announcement. Um, and that's going to be at like, I think it's like 8 AM, right? OK. But don't, but don't worry. If, some, if something happens and you're like 15 minutes late, I'm not going to like lock the door or something like that, OK? You're fine. Like, I've heard stories. That's not, that's not going to happen here. <laughs> but that is pretty early. But um, I do recommend getting there on time. Um, very important because you will need a good amount of that time to answer all the questions because in order to make like a good test Like I said, I have to have a, a good number of questions on there Okay, any other questions about the final or anything else before we get started? Okay, cool, so we were talking about relativity of time and if observers are going to agree that the speed of the light, that they, the light speed in a vacuum is the same, regardless of their reference frame, that's got to change something. So something's going to change, and it turns out that it's going to be this time interval. That's one of the things. It's not the only thing that's going to change either. But how do we see that? So we take this sort of situation where we have two people one of them is sitting on a train and moving with some constant velocity, and the other person's on the ground. And they're both inertial observers because the train is not accelerating. It's going at a constant speed, so the laws of physics hold equally valid in both frames of reference. Again, the, the cr critical point here is that we're talking about inertial frames, so there's no acceleration going on. If there were, that does change the physics laws. We have to modify them. Um, so we can derive a relationship between time intervals in different coordinate systems. We can consider a thought experiment. Um, and as before, we've got a frame of reference, S prime, which moves along the common x, x prime axis with constant speed u 
relative to a frame s. So we talked about this, that u must be less than the speed of light. So um, our observer on the train, Mavis, who's riding along with frame s prime, measures this time interval between two events that occur at the same point in space. Event one is when a flash of light from a light source, O prime, uh, goes off. And event two is when the flash returns to O prime. So what we can do is we can send a light ray and we can reflect it off of a mirror a distance D away, as shown in figure 37, this figure right here. So we've got this source of light and we're reflecting it off of a mirror. But remember, this, this light source is not just, um, we're not stationary here, we're moving with some velocity. So in the time that this uh, light source goes from the source to the mirror and back again, it doesn't just follow this path. In certain reference frames, it follows a path that looks like a triangle because we're actually moving at some velocity there. Um, so we can see that um, the time interval that it takes um, is delta t0 for this observer's time interval. So we're, it's going to be called 2d over c. That's going to be our time interval. So delta t, the, the time elapsed, is 2d over the speed of light. So we can check and see that that does indeed have units of time. So d, where d is the distance that the light travels. <clears throat> I'll just do it. So we've got this D here, and it goes, it, it's emitted from the source. The light's emitted, bounces off the mirror, and goes back again. So um, in the frame of S prime, Mavis observes the light pulse emitted from a source at O prime, so this is, this is their source. Mavis's source is O prime. And um, she observes it reflected back along the same line. So in her frame of reference, she, she can't tell whether she's moving or not. She just sees the light goes off, reflects back, it's done. Um, so then the time interval for her is 2d over c because the time that it takes to travel, since the speed of light is constant, if we know how far light travels, then we know how much time it took because it's always the same. It's just a constant. So that becomes a simple problem to solve for. So then, but what about Stanley? Remember Stanley was standing there on the ground. What does he measure for the same light pulse? So. Stanley observes something different. See this picture here? This is, this is kind of important. So um, this is what Mavis sees. Mavis is on the train. She sees it go up and down. She looks over to her uh, left or right, or over to her right, because the pulse is going off here. But Stanley measures it like a triangle, because for him, the light pulse goes in this direction like this because they're moving at constant, Mavis is moving at constant velocity. So Stanley sees the path of the light ray as something different, source, source. So it's important to emphasize that both of these locations represent the source. So the light comes back to the source, but it does not come back to the same point in space-time for this observer. So we have a situation where we actually have to um, solve for what Stanley sees.
Okay, so the light pulse travels at the same speed as in S prime, but travels a greater distance in S. So the round trip measured by Stanley is a different time interval. How do we represent this time interval delta t? <clears throat> uh, sir, hang up the phone. OK. So during the time delta t, the source moves relative to s, a distance u delta t. In s prime, the round trip distance is 2d, perpendicular to the relative velocity. But the round trip distance in s is a longer distance. It's 2L, where L is equal to this root d squared plus u delta t over 2 squared. And I want everybody to get out a piece of paper and sketch this so that you can understand geometrically what's going on here, so that it makes sense. Because there's a lot going on in this little thought experiment here. We've got this u delta t, OK? And we've got that represents a distance in Stanley's reference frame. So we've got to understand how do we describe these two observers and what they see and how the time elapses. So the round trip distance is 2d and it's perpendicular to the relative velocity. But the round trip distance in S is longer. It's the longer distance, 2L. So L here is this. So we've got L here. We can make this into like a right triangle. And then we've got U delta T over 2. Okay, so now we have to solve for L. So we have the Pythagorean theorem here, and we've got D here. So this is the this is the thing that relates the two frames. D, D is here and D is here. So both of these expressions have D in them, so we can come up with a relationship between these coordinates now. So how do we solve for this? Well, we've got a squared plus b squared equals c squared. That's just the simplest thing ever that we learned in geometry in sixth grade. Well, we're going to use that now. So we've got a squared plus, so we're going to say u delta t over 2 squared plus d squared equals l squared so then we can solve for L, and we can take plus or minus. We're going to take the plus term, the plus solution. So we have a positive solution for L then. So now you can see how we got L is equal to this. It comes from turning these two paths that are symmetrical into right triangles and solving for it. OK, so in writing this expression, we have assumed that both observers measure the same distance d. We'll justify this assumption in the next section. The speed of light is the same for both observers. So the round trip measured in s is given by this. So delta t then is changed by this amount for Stanley. Stanley observes a different delta t. So let's see that one more time, because that's a sleight of hand. So in writing this expression, we assume both observers measure the same distance d. And we, they do. They do measure the same distance. Um, they don't necessarily measure the same distance in every direction. But in the perpendicular direction in which d is going, that they can agree upon. And we'll, we'll show that later. But for now, just take that as noted. OK, so then we can solve for delta t. Remember, we had a delta t for 
Mavis was simple, 2D over C. It's not so simple for Stanley. It's 2L over C. So why is it 2L over C? Because the light has to travel this L distance. So it's got to go here and here in Stanley's reference frame. And remember, we describe time in terms of units of the speed of light, because since the speed of light is constant for everybody, we no longer, we can also treat it as a distance by simply dividing by the distance. The distance divided by the velocity, in other words, gives us the time. The units work out, and in, since it's universal, it works. So we're going to, we have L expressed in terms of this expression for D. So we can express delta T in terms of a D as well, but it's going to be very different. So it's going to be this expression, 2L divided by C. So we just put a factor of 2 in front of there and divide by C. OK. So 2L divided by C. And that's our, that's our T for Stanley. So we have delta T Stanley. OK. So now we would like to have a relationship between delta t, and we'll call this delta t0 for Mavis's frame. That's independent of d. So to get this, we solve for this equation for d and substitute the result. So we can express in terms of d, we have an expression for d. It's related to here. So we have C delta T0 over 2 is equal to D. Comes right from here. Now all I have to do is take this expression and plug it into here for this one. So this is ex essentially what Albert Einstein did when he derived his special relativity. It turns out that it doesn't even require, this particular derivation doesn't even require any super advanced calculus. It just requires a little bit of imagination, playing around with ideas and seeing what you can get, and a little bit of algebra. So when you do that, you get this expression. So I can just C delta T over 2 squared. OK. So we'll just plug that in. C delta T over 2 squared. And that's my passage of time. And it's not delta t, it's delta t naught. So remember, this delta t is the passage of time for whom? Mavis, correct. So we have the passage of time for Stanley in terms of the passage of time for Mavis. And notice that the passage of time for Stanley is not the same as the passage of time for Mavis. Delta T Stanley is not equal to delta T Mavis or delta T not. The two, if the two were equal, this, none of this stuff could be here. It would just be delta T zero. So there's some difference here. And then we can solve for delta T because notice we still have delta t in part of this function. It's not purely in terms of delta t. There's also a delta t mixed in here. So what we have to do is we have to get rid of this radical by squaring both sides. And then we have to move some stuff around. It's, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, you just have to basically you square this, OK? Put this, you square that, and then we get rid of this radical here, because we squared that. We have to square this as well. So we have 4 over c squared. And then we just distribute this factor and move, delta, move this delta t over, subtract it. So we have two terms involving delta t. And then 
we can solve for it since the quantity 1 minus u squared over c squared is less than 1, delta t is greater than delta t naught. So what we, what we do here then is we actually um, write this term in terms of a relative velocity. So they factor this, they factor out this term here, and they say that these two differences in speeds here, the, the relative velocity u here, that's going to be what matters. So u is the difference between the observer's speeds relative to the speed of light. So moving stuff around a little bit, we can solve for delta t and get it in terms of u and delta t naught. And that's what we get. So we have delta t is equal to delta t naught divided by 1 minus u squared over c squared. And that all comes from just working this out, this expression. OK. So yes? OK, so you're asking, how do, we solve for, how do we solve for this when there's a delta t here and there's a delta t here? Is that what you're asking about? Um, well, I, did, I didn't actually finish solving that. So I can, I can solve it algebraically right now if you want me to. But you're asking, what's the source of it? Where does it come from? Yes, they are. So OK, I see what you're saying. So I have this as delta t Stanley. So what I can do is, let's do this. That I see exactly what you're talking about. Does that make it clear? Yes. So this is delta T S, this is delta T S. You're right. I had it as Stanley, which looks like there's three times, there's not. So yes. So this is t Stanley's time as well. And then I can solve for it. Yes. OK. So um, and then this needs to be squared, since I squared everything here. So that's squared. OK. Does that look good? OK, great. Thank you for that. So we've got, when we solve for it, so this is delta t s, and then this is uh, Mavis's time. But then we just drop the subscript delta t s, because we know that Stan Lee and Mavis are two different observers. And we just denote the two different times by this one. Yes. U is this, it came about in this expression, U delta T. So it's the, um, the relative velocity between the two observers. Because, because, OK, so that's a good question. So what this geometrically represents is this represents a path in time that light takes. This does. And this represents the path in time that the train takes. So the train is moving at some velocity relative to Stanley u. It's, if it's going, if Stanley's not moving and the train is moving at u, then u is what? It, it, is it, if the train is moving at 100 kilometers per hour, what is u then? 100 kilometers per hour. And just like the light, if we multiply the speed of light um, by a, a delta t, we're going to get we're going to get it in the right units. So we've got this we've got this meters per second per second that gives us units of distance here as well. So our units check out. So it's this. So what u delta t represents is it represents the relative distance that um, Mavis travels in Stanley's frame while the light is traveling. So while the light goes off and bounces off of the mirror, the train has traveled some distance, u delta t, in Stanley's frame of reference. In Mavis's frame of reference, she doesn't know she's moving 
she could say, I haven't moved any distance at all. But she has in Stanley's frame of reference. OK, does that point make sense now? OK, great. So we have all of our variables here. We solve for this in terms of delta ts by moving things over, factoring it, and we get this for delta t. OK, so we can generalize this result. If we, what if a particular frame of reference, two events occur at the same point in space? If these events are ticks of a clock, then this is the frame of reference at which the clock is at rest. So we call this the rest frame of the clock. There's only one frame of reference in which a clock is at rest, and there are infinitely many in which it is moving. What do they mean by that? What they mean by that is that in this situation, there's one frame of reference that's the rest frame, Mavis. She's not moving. Stanley's another reference frame where she is moving in that one. But then there could be somebody else walking this way, and they also are an, a, another observer where the clock is not at rest. The point is that you can always create an infinite number of different frames that are different where there's different relative velocities. But there's only one frame of reference where the clock is perceived to be not in motion, and that's the rest frame. So that's important because we can always jump to the rest frame to figure out things about the problem that are intrinsic. Yes? So is the rest frame just the time of zero? No. So that's a good question. So the, the, time, the point at which time equals zero is the start of our analysis of the space-time interval. And I know you don't exactly know what the space-time interval means yet, but I might as well just say it now. So when these events occur, they don't just occur in space, they also occur in time. Time is no longer a scalar, immutable object that just is. Time has a dynamical existence. Time plays a role uh, as a vector, in a sense. It's, a, it's part of a space-time vector or a space-time interval. And at time t equals 0, that's when we can start the clocks. We can always find a frame where Mavis and Stanley agree that time is, hasn't started yet, too. We can start the clock at the same time. The clocks start at the same time, and they can, they can be started where they have the same reading, even, if we just start the thing off at some initial point, and it hasn't been traveling for any distance yet. But the important point is, once the clocks start, the clocks don't tick at the same time. They have different intervals in space-time. It's like Mavis is traveling on one part of a, of a coordinate plane, and Stanley's on another coordinate plane. And so since they're not on the same trajectory in space-time, in this coordinate trajectory, they don't agree on all of their measurements. In this case, they're going to agree on their measurements of y and z, that they're both, neither one of them has, has had any change, because her height hasn't changed. She's just going this way. What they won't agree upon is x and t. Those two things they're not going to agree upon. She doesn't, she doesn't know she's moving. She's just like in an inertial frame of reference. There's no way for her to tell. So she sees no, t no distance change. And uh, the change in time is just whatever this was. But Stanley, he sees a different change in time given by this expression. So um, the time interval measured between two events, such as two ticks of the clock that occur at the same point in a particular frame, is a more fundamental quantity than the interval between events at different points. We use the term proper time to describe the time interval between two events that occur at the same point. OK. So if what they're saying there is they're talking about two events that occur at the same point for a single observer. What I was just talking about was you could have an event that occurs at two different points for two different observers. If, if an event occurs at the same point for the same observer, then it's proper time. So for example, it's proper time 
for Mavis because when the light ray comes back down and strikes the source, she hasn't moved any distance from where her initial starting point was in her frame of reference. She's just stationary here. So for her point in her frame of reference, it's the light comes and comes back and both events occur at the same point in space. Thus, it's proper time in her reference frame. It's not, it's not the case for Stanley that the light ray comes back and lands at the same point that it started at in his frame of reference. She's moved some distance, U delta T in that time, so he does not have the proper time. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Which person is more right? Which time is more correct? There is no such thing as that. Both observers have equally valid time measurements. They just don't agree on the time. But it is the case that Mavis's frame of reference is special because in her frame of reference, the clock is not um, moving. It's, it's, it's the only frame of reference that can be treated as stationary. So it is given a special quasi status as proper. But is it really proper in any physical sense? No. Yes, question. The proper time, let's, let's, let's work, work through this in a very rigorous way. So we have here that the proper time is the, is the frame of reference in which the clock can be perceived to be stationary, right? Even though she's moving at constant speed, she can't tell because when you're moving at a constant velocity, you, you can't say whether you're at rest or whether you're in motion. But because she has no, she has no way to measure a change in distance, her, her change, her position from, with, from the clock, from where she started and where she ends, is the same. The clock, or the, the source of the light, I should say, and the clock. They're both sitting there on the train with her, and their distances aren't changing. But for Stanley, the, the distance has changed. It was here, and then at some later time, it's all the way over here. Both the clock and the light source are at a different point in his frame of reference. Thus, is his time proper, yes or no? What do you think? No, okay, correct. Is her time proper in this frame of reference? Yes, okay, great. So, now we have a clear definition for what we're going to consider, yes? I'm sorry, what's that? This is what it means in this context. Um, we use the term proper time to describe the time interval between two events that occur at the same point. It's the event of the light. The light comes up and it strikes again. And it occurs at the same point in whose frame of reference? Mavis's, right. So in her frame of reference, that event occurs at the same point. Thus, it's the proper time but not in Stanley's, so his is not the proper time. Okay, so let delta T naught be the proper time between the two events. That is, the time is measured by an observer at rest in the frame in which the events occur at the same point. Then our above result says that an observer in a second frame, moving with constant speed u relative to the rest frame, we'll measure the time interval to be delta t, where delta t is given by this. Okay, so we've got delta t is the time interval between the same events measured in the second frame of reference. So delta t here, for this situation, it represents how much time it takes, how much time passes between when this light strikes the mirror and when it comes back to the source. Meanwhile, the train has been moving some distance. That's the time that it represents here. Delta T zero, Mavis's time, is the time that she perceives that it takes for the light to come up, strike the mirror, and come back down in her frame of reference. And U is the speed of the second frame relative to the rest frame. So he's at rest, she's moving at 100 kilometers per hour, whatever it is in kilometers per second, I don't know, but something like 
basic, basically like 100 divided by, you know, 3,600. So we have so many kilometers per second going on here. So we've got basically you then, if you just think of it as like, okay, if the, if the whole process takes like, in, in actuality, this mirror process is gonna take a fraction of a second because light's speed is incredibly rapid. In fact, like if we did this experiment, delta T, you could figure this out really easily. You just take the speed of light. You'd have to shoot this mirror. It'd have to be like really far distance for us to even measure the difference in time with it, even the most sensitive clock. But the, the experiment works as a thought experiment. There technically is a difference in, uh, you know, how much time it takes for one observer versus the other. But you can tell that it's going to be incredibly small because, look, you have this velocity here. I mean, how fast are things going in our everyday experience? I don't know, five meters per second, something like that? So this is going to be tiny. It's going to almost look like the two times are exactly the same. So this isn't going to be something that's going to be easy to observe experimentally. But it has been observed with satellites. It took until the era of, I won't say space travel because we're not there yet, but satellites being launched in order for these types of things to be measured uh, experimentally. But they have been with satellites. Okay, so we recall that no inertial observer can travel at u is equal to c. And we note that 1 minus u squared over c squared is imaginary for u greater than c. Thus, this equation gives sensible results only when u is less than c. So the denominator of equation 37.6 is always smaller than 1. So delta t is always larger than delta t0. Thus, we call this effect time dilation. So there, the time is always going to be longer for one observer than it is for the other. Um, delta t is always larger than delta t0 because this value is 1 minus this. So this passage of time, and what, and what, happens, what happens for um, a situation where you um, move at the speed of light? you get c squared, 1 minus c squared over c squared, 1 minus 1, it just becomes undefined, imaginary. Okay, so think of the pendulum clock that has one second between its ticks as measured by Mabus and the clock's rest frame. This is delta t zero. If the clock's rest frame is moving relative to Stanley, he measures a time between ticks delta t that is longer than one second. So observers measure any clock to run slow if it moves relative to them. It's going to be measured to be going slower for them. And note that this conclusion is a direct result of the fact that the speed of light in a vacuum is the same in both frames of reference. So the only way to have the speed of light being the same in both frames of reference is for time to be passing slower in one frame than the other. And why do we feel comfortable saying that this crazy result is valid? What makes us feel comfortable in saying that time must be the thing that's dynamic and not the speed of light? What's, so, what's, the, what's the, I'm sorry, what was that? Yes, so because Maxwell's equations, because if the speed of light was variable, then we wouldn't have um, Maxwell's equations being obeyed properly in every frame of reference. The Maxwell's equations would change in some ways. So it's a pretty, uh, it's a very subtle argument, but nonetheless, it's a valid one. Yes, question. Yes. And you can see that if you plug in values here. Just plug in any value other than, than zero, and you're gonna get you're gonna get a distance that you're gonna, delta t is gonna become less than delta t naught. Anything less than. 
So um, what would be, actually, let's, let's, uh, let's test your understanding. The person just asked the question. What, is it possible, yeah, is it, is, it, is it possible for, is it possible for anybody else to have a delta t? Where would they be if they had a delta t that equaled delta t naught in this situation we were just talking about? Where would, they, where would they be located in this occurrence? Like we've got a train passing, we've got a person observing a train. If we had another observer who said, oh, my delta t is equal to delta t naught as well, where would that person be located in this frame? Yeah, well, okay, so just don't tell him the answer. Let him think about this for a second since he want to rack his brain a little bit. Where would, he be, where would, where would this person need to be located? Do I need to tell you the answer? Okay, they would need to be located on the train with Mavis. Yeah, because if they're located on the train, then they're also, they're, they're, their distance with respect to the events is also not changing. They're just standing there. Now, if they're walking on the train or doing something else, that's different. But as long as they're stationary too, yeah. Um... Yeah, as long as they're moving at exactly the same speed, as long as their distance, as long as their distance never changes relative to the whole event, and they're moving at the, we can, we can transform them to whatever frame they're in. Yeah, you could say that. Yeah. Yes. So that's an interesting question. So. So he asks, what about when the train comes to a stop? Okay, when the train comes to the stop, what happens is the term here, this term here goes to zero and delta t and delta t not agree again because their relative velocity with respect to each other is again the same. And what happens all the way along the way? It is kind of like an arc. It's an, it, this becomes an integral because you have to integrate all the infinitesimally small bits. But there's another problem though. When the train comes to a stop, there's one big problem. There had to have been acceleration that occurred. So it's not such a simple case when you have a situation where the train comes to a stop because you also have to consider the fact that there had to have been acceleration occurring. So this first order analysis only works for frames of reference where there's no acceleration going on. When we have acceleration going on, we have to take the situation carefully. And there's something called the twin paradox that's going to come up because there's acceleration that occurs in that situation. Very good question. Okay, so does that make sense the, about the equation and how to apply this? Because this will definitely be, you'll definitely need this for the final to answer these questions. So make sure this all makes perfect sense. That's explained really clearly in your mind and that you can connect the dots. I know it's, it's not so easy. You have to really picture this stuff happening. Um, any questions about this before I move on? Okay. So we can use this funny little squiggly symbol called gamma and we call it the Lorenz factor. Gamma just equals, oh, and then they give us other, <laughs> they love to do this. They love to take the symbol and be like, okay, gamma is equal to uh, one over, sorry, this is kind of getting in the way, one over square root of, and then it's like this term here. So um, one minus B beta squared, one minus beta squared. And what is beta equal to? Beta is just equal to this uh, U squared over C squared, U actually. Beta is just equal to u. So this is just another way of writing this without the delta t. So if we have 1 over this, so then delta t is equal to gamma delta t naught. So that's what that gamma means. Does that make sense? It's just like a little redefinition of symbols. Okay, so there's a picture of what this looks like. So we can see gamma as a function of the relative speed u of two frames of reference. When u is very small compared to c, 
u squared over c squared is much smaller than 1, and gamma is very nearly equal to 1. In that limit, equation 37.6 and 37.8 approach the Newtonian relationship, delta t equals delta t naught corresponding to the same time interval in all frames of reference. So um, does that make sense how they got that plot to everybody? OK, good. So they just took, they just took different speeds here, and they calculated gamma. So this is gamma as a function of relative speed. So you can see that as the speed approaches c, this comes, this gamma factor gets exponentially larger. This gamma can go up to infinity. And as long as it goes up, even as high as it goes, it will never reach the speed of light. And so this is interesting. So, so let's say you have uh, protons accelerating, and they reach they reach nearly the speed of light. And you can't really get them going any faster. But you still keep taking these protons, and you give them more energy from the magnetic field. You just keep the magnetic field pu pulsing, and you pulse them with more energy. So they're going, getting even more energy. How, where does this energy go into these protons? We know the protons are absorbing energy, but they're not gaining kinetic energy because they can't really go any faster. So where, what's happening, where, where's the energy that the magnets is pumping into it going into? It's going into increasing the mass of the protons. So these protons, when they, when they take these protons and they collide them together at CERN, they actually increase the mass of the protons. So if you take an object that's massive and you get it going really, really fast, and you can't really get it going any faster, but you're still able to give it more energy, it gets that energy that you give it gets stored as mass energy. Pretty interesting. And it's because you can never reach that speed of light. That's that cutoff there. So if the relative speed u is great enough that gamma is appreciably greater than 1, the speed is said to be relativistic. Um, and if the difference between gamma and 1 is very small, the speed is non-relativistic. So if u is 0.2 times the speed of light, so 20% the speed of light, that's a relativistic speed. But anything going even as fast as our fastest rockets are sadly not relativistic. So we're not there yet. We haven't reached the relativistic speed era for travel. So there's a big caution here. This is the biggest caution I've ever seen in this book. This is like a mini book in its own right. What are they talking about? All right, let's see. <laughs> Measuring time intervals. It's important to note that the time interval in delta, delta t, OK, they're talking about this involves events that occur at different space points in the frame of reference s. Note also that any differences between delta t and the proper time, delta t naught, are not caused by differences in times required for light to travel from those space points to an observer at rest in s. So we assume that our observer can correct for differences in light transit times, just as an astronomer who's observing the sun understands that an event seen now on Earth actually occurred 500 s ago on the sun's surface. Oh yeah, if it occurred on the sun's surface, then it would be 500 seconds ago. OK. So the sunspots, because it takes seven minutes for light to travel from the sun to the earth, I think, something like that. OK, alternatively, we can use two observers, one stationary at the location of the first event and the other at the second, each with his or her own clock. We can synchronize these clocks without difficulty as long as they are at rest in the same frame of reference. For example, we could send a light pulse simultaneously to the two clocks from a point midway between them. When the pulses arrive, the observers set their clocks to a prearranged time. But clocks that are synchronized in one frame of reference are not, in general, synchronized in any other frame. So that's a little bit confusing. Uh, you're going to have to wrap your brain around that a little bit, about synchronizing clocks and things like that. Um, that's also. That little fact about time ticking at different times, that's actually got a name. It's called the problem of time. And it's one of the biggest problems in physics because when you treat uh, in quantum field theory, usually you work in one frame of reference, time frame of reference for the fields. 
And um, it's very difficult to formulate something that's consistent that has different clock times ticking. So yeah, that's a, that's a, this is still a problem today in physics, making this work mathematically. OK, so in thought experiments, it's often helpful to imagine many observers with synchronized clocks at rest at various points in a particular frame of reference. We could picture a frame of reference as a coordinate grid with lots of synchronized clocks distributed around it. So imagine we have this grid of clocks. That's our time, right? That's a way of visualizing time as this coordinate space. It has a coordinate value. Um, and you know what? This is kind of a cool way to think about this. Nobody, I, I was thinking about this one day. So like, imagine you have like a sheet of graph paper, okay? You won't, you won't see this in the book. This is just like my own little, I haven't rigorously tested this, but I think this is okay to think about just like in an intuitive sense. Okay, so let's say, let's say I have a sheet of graph paper here. And let's say, let's say I have some, uh, some time passage, and I'm stationary. So I start a clock, and I just say that I have this little arrow that starts, and it represents like the distance that light has traveled in some time. If I have, an, if I have the same sheet of graph paper, but, and it has the same, let's say that the grids even have the same distances. I didn't draw it that way, but just imagine that they have the same distances, okay? But then imagine that, imagine that this grid of paper flies across this sheet of graph paper, and it has some constant velocity relative to it. And then it measures the length of this same arrow, but on its grid. It's going to cover a, it's going to cover a different distance, isn't it? Because it's moving at some, some v, so it's passing. There's, a, there's not an agreement there between these two measurements here. You can, sort of, you can sort of think of this geometrically as kind of the same idea, except that with, with the, um, in this case, with the relativity, it's not quite that simple because we have like this sort of triangle with a hypotenuse, but instead of the hypotenuse being the largest length, it's the shortest length in space-time. And we can, we can show that maybe if we had time, to, if we actually delve into the geometry of space-time. What you do is, to get into the geometry of space-time, you actually draw this like light cone where you say that you've got some distance ct, and then anything that is going less than the speed, anything that goes the speed of light defines this light cone. So this light cone spreads out some distance per time. It goes, it travels like three times 10 to the eighth meters each second. Everything that it, it, it opens up, right, it creates this light cone. If I'm not moving at the speed of light, I have to travel on a trajectory that's inside of this light cone somewhere, and nothing can travel outside of it. And so that defines another way of defining the geometry of space-time that's occurring here. Um, don't worry about this too much. The stuff I just did the last couple of minutes, that's not going to be on the exam or anything like that. But it just sort of like helps to visualize what's really going on here. Okay, so we imagine these, this grid of three-dimensional clocks going on here. And there's identical planes of clocks that lie in front of and behind the page, connected by grid lines perpendicular to the page. So we've got a frame of reference pictured as a coordinate system with a grid of synchronized clocks. OK, tell you what, let's do a five minute break really quick. Give everybody a chance to get a break. OK, everybody, let's get started again. Give everybody a minute to get back in their seats here. <clears throat> OK, so throughout this chapter, we're going to use phrases like Stanley observes Mavis passes the point x equals 5 meters 
y0, z equals 0 at time 2 seconds, like when we had the train going along the x-axis here. This means that Stanley is using a grid of clocks in his frame of reference, like the grid shown in this figure here, to record the time of an event. We could restate the phrase as when Mavis passes the point x equals 5, y equals 0, z equals 0, the clock at that location in Stanley's frame of reference reads 2 seconds. But we're going to avoid using phrases we're going to avoid using phrases like Stanley sees that Mavis is at a certain point at a certain time because there is a time delay for light to travel to Stanley's eye from the position of an event. Okay, so let's do an example. Let's test your relativistic ability for solving problems. High energy subatomic particles coming from space interact with atoms in the Earth's upper atmosphere. In some cases, they produce unstable particles called muons. A muon decays into other particles with a mean lifetime of 2.2 microseconds, as measured in a reference frame in which it is at rest. If a muon is moving at 0.990 c relative to the Earth, what will an observer on Earth measure its mean lifetime to be. Okay, so let's think about what we have here. We've got um, the high energy subatomic particle decay has a lifetime of 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. So that's a time. That's some type of time. The lifetime of the particle, we'll say. So there's going to be a frame of reference where that's the case. But there's also going to be other frames of reference too. There's an infinite number of them, in fact. So we've got, um, we've got this 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6. What will an observer on Earth measure the muon's mean lifetime to be? So um, we've got delta t equals 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Now, we've got an observer on Earth measuring something, and that's what we're going to solve for. But we have to figure out something. Which one is delta t and which one is delta t naught? Because if I get this wrong, I'm going to get the wrong answer. I can't just plug in whichever one I want here. It's going to be, one of them is going to be different than the other. So, um, so what is it, what is it going to be then? Um, anybody got any guesses here? Um, if it's moving at point, and it's moving you, it's moving relative to the earth at 0 0.99, I think it was. Yeah, so 99% the speed of light. So it's going at this. So we have its relative speed and we have its time. What do you think? Which one is it going to be? Yes. Is the which one at rest? What's yeah? Which one is the time at rest? Which one is the rest frame? Which one do we use? You think it's t naught? Okay, great. So let's see. So is it t naught? So. For the proper time, so it, here it says yes, correct, because we know we know how long it survives in its frame of reference, but that's that's its proper time. It's also got a different survival time in the Earth observer's frame of reference. Does that make sense? How we came to that conclusion, or is it a little bit confusing? Okay, not too bad. All right then, so. The muon's lifetime is the time interval between two events, the production of the muon and its subsequent decay. Our target variable is the lifetime in our frame of reference on Earth, which we call frame S. We're given the lifetime in frame S prime in which the muon is at rest. So did it, did it say that it was at rest in the beginning? As measured in reference frame in which it's at rest. Okay, good. So it was very straightforward. Sometimes you get problems like these where they don't tell you and you have to figure it out. So that's good that they were clear about that. Okay, good. So 
We know exactly that it, we're going to do. We're going to use this formula now, and we're going to see how long it survives. So it's going to be, um, so this is delta t naught, and then we're going to have the Earth observer, we're going to observe it to survive for 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6 seconds divided by square root of 1 minus 0 0.990 squared. OK, so what does that give us for how long? 15.6 microseconds. So this is, this is interesting because this particle survives longer than it does in the particle's reference frame. So that means that the distances that it's traveling must be different too. Because it has more time to travel more distance in our frame of reference than it does in its frame of reference. So that's pretty weird. We know that because we know that we can measure distances by how much time has elapsed and the velocity that something is going. So what that means is that this particle, not only does it survive longer, it has a longer lifetime in our reference frame by a factor of like seven, a little over seven, seven times longer. But it also has a different distance it travels. It travels further in our frame of reference. So it predicts that the mean lifetime of the muon in the Earth frame is about seven times longer, and it's been verified experimentally. And this apparently was the first confirmation of the time dilation formula. So when they started figuring out how to uh, look at the subatomic particles traveling through Earth's atmosphere, um, they figured out ways to trace particle trajectories in these things called bubble chambers and cloud chambers, which basically what happens is that the subatomic particle leaves behind a track. It doesn't survive very long, but it like, it's like you look at its paw prints in the snow, essentially. And you can do that with, with clouds and, and things in the atmosphere. Certain subatomic particles, they don't exist long enough to be seen with a clock because it's like, this is a tiny interval of time. We don't have clocks that sensitive to say, oh, it's here, now it's, there, now it's gone. But we look and we say, hey, look, we can see how long its path was. Therefore, we can infer its lifetime. But when they looked at the lifetime of these particles, the tracks, the tracks were much longer in the atmosphere than they were correspondingly in these bubble chambers. We knew it was the same particle because it had the same signature. It had the same, like, quote unquote paw print in the snow. So we knew that it was a muon, right? But they didn't see the same distance travel, so we knew that it had a different lifetime depending upon which observer was looking for it. And it doesn't explain how they did that exactly, but that was how, that's essentially how they did it. They used um, these brilliant experiments in bubble chambers and cloud chambers to figure out what these particles do um, and the signatures they leave behind, and then they could measure their lifetimes that way. Okay, next problem. Airplane flies from San Francisco to New York about 4,800 kilometers, or 4.8 times 10 to the 6 meters, at a steady speed of 300 meters per second. How much time does the trip take as measured by an observer on the ground? And then how long does it take by an observer on the plane? Okay. So we have these two different things. So as measured in S, the two events occur at different positions, San Francisco and New York. So the time interval measured by ground observers, delta T, corresponds to this. We just divide by the distance of the relative speed. So we've got this distance traveled of 4.8 times 10 to the 6th meters, um, and that's divided by 300 meters per second. So then we get 1.6 times 10 to the fourth seconds. So about four and a half hours. So we've got our delta T there. So I can erase this. Got a new problem. Delta T is about 1.6 times 10 to the fourth seconds. 
and we just do that simple, you know, distance divided by velocity calculation. So now we have to figure out in the airplane's frame, S prime, San Francisco and New York passing under the plane occur at the same point, the position of the plane. Hence the time interval in the airplane is the proper time corresponding to T naught. So we have the proper time is going to be the time in the airplane. Now they're going to find this u squared over c squared factor that comes about from this equation. So they just calculate this explicitly because it's a little bit easier than plugging all these numbers into this big long formula. So they're going to say, OK, u squared over c squared, 300 meters per second squared divided by 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second squared gives us 1 times 10 to the minus 12 factor. So beta is tiny. This, this factor is like, so it's gamma is equal to square root of 1 minus this u squared over c squared, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 12. So this is a really, really small. It's a really small factor, definitely not moving at a relativistic speed. But nonetheless, it is a slight correction. So I've got my gamma factor here, and I've got my delta t. Um, I know what delta t naught is. Or no, I know what delta t is. So I can multiply um, delta t by this to get my delta t naught. So I just have gamma. So delta t is equal to gamma gamma delta t naught. And then gamma is just this 1 over fraction. So I have this divided by gamma is equal to delta t. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like this. So we have, um, let me erase this here. So delta t naught then is equal to delta t, which we solved for. It's 1.6 times 10 to the 4 seconds. That multiplied by, move this over to the other side, multiplied by this square root of 1 minus 1 times 10 to the minus 12. So it's like barely any difference. It's very small. But it is like slightly so we can approximate this. So it's going to be like 1 minus some tiny corrective fraction. So the change in time is less than 1 part in 10 to the 12. So this is so small of a correction that you might not even be able to do it on all calculators. But you could do it, you know. So um, we don't notice these effects in everyday life. But we have atomic clocks that can attain a precision of about one part in 10 to the 13. And a cesium clock traveling a long distance in an airliner has been used to measure this effect and verify 37.6, even at speeds much less than the speed of light. So they did do this experiment. They got aboard a plane, and they flew for a really long time. I think it was like a day or something crazy like that, 24 hours. A couple of crazy scientists with their cesium clock. Um, the clock did measure a difference in time. But they did this in an even better way because we've got GPS satellites now. So GPS satellites, they're orbiting Earth, and they're going way faster than, um, than a plane. right? They're going extremely fast. Well, they have so many crazy things going on. They have people in charge assigned to these things to make adjustments because the clocks are always off compared to the clocks on Earth. And not just because of the speed that they're going at either. Also, it turns out, and we're not going to have time to show this, but it turns out that gravitational fields also slow time. And you know that because you watched uh, Interstellar, maybe, and you saw that. Okay, so um, I don't know why 
the, the Dr. Brand character is still the same age, didn't age when he went into the black hole and everybody else aged. I think, I'm, not, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out if that's, if that's correct or not. That might be an error, but you know, at the very end. But the time dilation aspect of it, what they covered on the first part was pretty consistent. I think everybody, they got that pretty well when they have the, they land on that water planet. Okay, so this has been observed and measured experimentally. Is it the final answer on time? Who knows? We haven't solved the problem of time yet. We don't have a quantum answer for time. But for, for what we know, as far as we know, this is pretty good. We know that time is relative and it's been measured experimentally. Okay, so um, yeah, I think we have time to do this one too. Mavis boards a spaceship and then zips past Stanley on Earth at a relative speed of 0.6 times the speed of light. At the instant she passes him, they both start timers. A short time later, Stanley measures that Mavis has traveled nine times 10 to the seven meters beyond him and is passing a space station. What does Stanley's timer read as she passes the space station? And what does Mavis's time read? So we're gonna compare how their clocks have changed since she, she took off in her spaceship. Then for part B, Stanley starts to blink just as Mavis flies past him. And Mavis measures that the blink takes 0.4 seconds from beginning to end. According to Stanley, what is the duration of his blink? Okay, so first we're gonna look the two events. Mavis is passing the Earth and the space station occur at different positions in Stanley's frame, but at the same position in Mavis's frame. Thus, Stanley measures the time interval, delta T, while Mavis measures the proper time, delta T naught. As measured by Stanley, Mavis moves at 0.6 times the speed of light and travels this far in this duration of time. So Mavis's timer reads an elapsed time of this. We've got five, half a second times this relativistic correction factor that gives us 0.4 seconds. Okay, so since Stanley measures 0.5 seconds elapsed on his timer, but only 0.4 seconds elapsed on Mavis's timer, Stanley concludes that Mavis's timer runs slow. So in Stanley's frame of reference, then, this clock of Mavis's is not ticking at the same speed as his. And, and they could be the same clock, okay? So that means that, um, what's kind of amazing about this is that that means that every physical process in the universe is relative. So we learned about like entropy and heat processes and all these things that just happen naturally. And there's only one direction for the process to go and everything else. But it turns out that w even with all that being true, depending upon your frame of reference, you won't measure that process happening at the same, at the same rate, which is kind of like mind boggling if you think about it. And you can see why like, so many people had a hard time accepting this crazy idea that time tra passes differently for different observers. Because first of all, you need really good measurements, which they didn't have in his time. And you also need really good, like a really good explanation for why the, how the heck could this be possible? And then that means that there's no universal time for anything. Well, then what even defines time itself? What even makes it? What even makes time? What is time? These are all questions that still lack a full answer. All we can say is that the passage of time for different observers is relative. What time actually is, we, cannot, we can't say. We don't get any answers for that. But anyway, we can do part B now. So it's tempting to say that the, the blink lasts five seconds in his frame, but it's wrong because now we're considering a different pair of events than in part A. The start and finish of Stanley's blink occur at the same point in his frame, but at different positions in Mavis's frame. So they tried to trick you there. They, they changed, they switched uh, proper times. The blink is different. He's got the proper time for the blink, not her. So we can't use the same 
delta t as we used in the first part of the problem. Does that make sense to everybody? Do you see how they pulled that quick little switch there? OK, so, that's a, so it's important to remember the person who's the proper observer, the delta t naught, they have to be in that frame of reference where the <coughs> clock is not changing for them. The, the, and the clock is stationary for him, but not for her. So, uh, so in part, so we have to read this again. So who measures what? Okay, so Mavis is, uh, Mavis is the one who, um, let's see. Okay, Stanley blinks just as Mavis flies past him, and Mavis measures the blink takes 0.4 seconds from beginning to end. So her time is not the proper time. His time is the proper time. So when we're solving this part, then we have to solve for delta t naught. We have to take the time she measures, multiply it by her relative speed, though, because her relative speed with respect to him is still 0.6 times the speed of light. So what is, what is the proper time for Stanley's blink? It's shorter. It's only 0.320 seconds. So like when she's flying past him, it looks like time is what? Traveling faster or slower for who's, which one does it look like time is traveling faster or slower for? Does it look like time's traveling faster for Mavis than it does for, um, for Stanley? In, if we looked at the two reference frames and we don't agree, yes. So she can't, she can't feel that the time is traveling differently, but for her, in the same, in the same, the same event, it takes way more time for the same event to occur. So more time passes, so hence time is traveling faster. Okay? So now you can see how time is like this vector because it's like the same event it's like a ruler almost, like a time measurement where the ruler doesn't agree. The two, dip, the two lengths are different in time. And her time is going faster. So for an event that takes, I don't know, only 0.32 of his time, it takes a lot more of her time, 0.4 of her time. So yes, every even 0.4 of a second is happening, that's, it's happening that much faster in her frame of reference. Okay, so sorry about that. Yeah, there we go. So does that make sense? Okay, great. So this example illustrates both time dilation and relativity of simultaneity. So in Mavis's frame, she passes the space station at the same instant that Stanley finishes his blink, 0.4 seconds after she passed Stanley. Hence, these two events are simultaneous to Mavis in frame S. But these two events are not simultaneous to Stanley in his frame. According to his timer, he finishes his blink after 0.32 seconds, and Mavis passes the space station after 0.5. See if you can figure, see if you can see what they're talking about right there. It's not so simple. What we're saying here is that the ordering of events is not even the same. And in, in this case, it's not so complicated, but you can have cases where events, for one person, they occur in this order, and for another observer, the order is reversed. That's another thing that made relativity so difficult, is the relativity of simultaneity. Like the ordering of events and how long things take gets, gets all scrambled up with this strange geometry of space-time. So let's just pause for a second and think about that. So um, in Mavis's frame, she passes the space station at the same instant that he finishes his blink, 0.4 seconds after she passed Stanley. So these two events are simultaneous in her frame. So she, she passes the space station and he finishes his blink. Happens at the same time for her. But the events are not the same in his frame. He finishes his blink 0.32 seconds, and Mavis passes the stay station after 0.5. So, so Mavis says, well, wait a second. You blinked. 
You blinked and I passed your space station at the same time. These events were simultaneous. He goes, no, they aren't. I finished my blink at 0.32 and I didn't see you pass the space station until later. So they don't agree on the ordering of events. An event that's simultaneous for her, her passing the space station and him blinking is, happens at the same time for her. It does not happen at the same time for him. Yes. So that's what we mean by relativity of simultaneity. No matter which inertial frame of reference you're in, you observe dilated time intervals for timekeeper clocks of any kind that move relative to you. If S and S prime are two inertial frames in relative motion, an observer in S measures clocks to in S prime to run slow, and an observer in S prime measures clocks in S to run slow. Okay, time for the twin paradox that I mentioned earlier. So, these equations for time dilation suggest an apparent paradox called the twin paradox. Well, let's consider identical twin astronauts named Eartha and Astrid. Eartha remains on Earth while her twin Astrid takes off on some high-speed trip through the galaxy. Because of time dilation, Eartha observes Astrid's heartbeat and all other life processes proceeding more slowly than her own. Thus, to Eartha, Astrid ages more slowly. When Astrid returns to Earth, she is younger, has aged less than Eartha. So, um, wait a second. Did I skip something here? I think, okay. Uh, yeah, I think, sorry, I think I made a little error on the slides here. Um, okay, so let's see here. Tell you what. Um, I will cover the twin paradox next class because I have to find that little missing point. But the, the point is, and I'll, I'll, I'll connect the dots. So here's the thing. All inertial observers are equivalent. So can we use these? Actually, yeah, I better, I better wait and go over this later. Okay, let's skip that for now. I'll do it next class. Let's do relativity of length. Okay. So not only does the time interval between two events depend on the observer's frame of reference, but the distance between two points may also depend on the observer's frame of reference. And we know that to be the case because, remember the muons, the muons travel, if, they, if they're traveling at some distance and they're traveling at some velocity here, in one frame of reference they survive longer than the other, so they might travel different distances. But we have to figure out, are they traveling the same length? Are they measuring distance the same way? It turns out they're not. So we can't, we can't make that simple assumption here. We have to also think about the fact that the lengths that they're traveling are different. And we can see that by looking at this problem again more carefully. So it turns out that not only does the time interval between two events depend on the observer's frame of reference, but the distance between two points may also depend on the observer's frame of reference. And the concept of simultaneity is involved. Suppose you want to measure the length of a moving car. One way is to have two assistants make marks on the pavement at the positions of the front and rear bumpers. Then you measure the distance between the marks. But your assistants have to make their marks at the same time. If one marks the position of the front bumper at one time, and the other marks the position of the rear bumper half a second later, you won't get the car's true length. Since we've learned that simultaneity isn't an absolute concept, we have to proceed with caution. Okay, so let's do the same, step through the same process we did with time and to cover it now with length. So we're gonna develop a relationship between lengths that are measured parallel to the direction of motion in various coordinate systems and we're gonna consider a thought experiment. We'll attach a light source to one end of a ruler and a mirror to the other end. So the ruler is at rest in frame S prime and its length in this frame is L zero. Then the time delta T required for a light pulse to make the round trip from source to mirror and back is given by this expression. Okay, so I'm gonna erase this now. We're gonna do relativity of length. So we've got 
this time delta t naught, that's going to be equal to 2 times the length divided by c. So let's see if we can get a figure for this. OK, so we've got Mavis again. She's stationary. And it's got this ruler has some length here. So I'll draw out this ruler. It's got some length L0. OK, from the light source. So there's a light source along here, and there's a mirror. So the light comes, and it bounces off again. So we're going to do the same process where we bounce a light off of a mirror, and we look at the two, the distance L0 from the light source to the mirror. So the time that it takes in Mavis's frame of reference is 2L0 divided by C. And that makes sense. It's got to travel this total distance, and it's going at the speed of light. So that's the time that it'll take, just like before. Um, but then what about Stanley? So uh, in Stanley's reference frame, we have a slightly different case. The ruler moves at speed u in Stanley's frame of reference, s. The light pulse travels a distance l, the length of the ruler, plus an additional distance u delta t1 from the light source to the mirror. OK, so here's the problem. We're not agreeing on distances now. We weren't, before, we weren't agreeing on time. Now we can't agree on distances. Because Stanley, who's standing over here and observing this process, he doesn't measure L0. Because this thing also travels a relative velocity u delta t. So the ruler, in his frame of reference, it doesn't end up at the same spot where it started. It ends up, it ends up over here. So the light has to travel here and back so they don't agree on the distance here. So we've got this u delta t. So in Stanley's frame of reference, the ruler's moving to the right with speed u during this travel of the light pulse. The length of the ruler in S is L, and the time of travel from source to mirror as measured in S is delta t1. So during this interval, the ruler with the source and mirror attached moves a distance u delta t1. The total length of path d from source to mirror is not L. It's going to be L plus u delta t1. So L is going to be L0 plus u delta t. OK. So the light pulse travels with speed c. So it's also true that d is equal to c delta t1. So d has to be equal to, so let's see here. Let me go back. OK, so that needs to be, that actually needs to be D, not L. So D, and then they're calling this length L um, something else. So I'm going to call this L, actually, not L0. OK, so we've got D is L plus U delta T1. OK, so, but D is also C delta T1. And then, so C delta T1 has to be equal to this. So we have C delta t1 equal to that equation there. And then we can solve for delta t1. And we get delta t1 is simply going to be, so we factor this out. So move this over. So we've got minus u delta t1 plus this. That's going to be L. And then we can do delta t1 minus u plus c equals l. We just divide this out, minus u plus c. And then we've got 
our expression for delta t1. Okay, so delta t1 is equal to L over minus u plus c. But then dividing the distance L by c minus u does not mean that the light travels with speed c minus u. It just means that the distance the pulse travels in s is greater than L. So in the same way, um, we can show that the time delta t2 for the return trip from the mirror to the source is this. Delta t2 is going to be L c plus u because it's going in the opposite sense. So just to illustrate here, we've got our, our length here is one thing on the train. Then we're seeing that Stanley sees a different length that the light travels. We're figuring out an equation to describe this and connect the two together. And then we can solve for the return journey. Delta T2 is just going to be this plus that. So delta T2 is just L C plus U instead of uh, C minus U. So then we've got the total time is just these two added together. So total delta T, it's delta T1 plus delta T2. Delta T1 is this, delta T2 is that. Make sense? OK, great. So we've got delta T then. Delta t, delta t1 plus delta t2. And then I've got, so it's going to be um, 2L over, so 2L, and then I'm going to erase that and make some space here, divided by uh, C times 1 minus u squared over C squared. So we can see the same kind of factor where the, the velocity re with respect to the speed of light is introduced. We also know that delta t and delta t naught are related by 37.6 because delta t naught is a proper time in S prime. Thus, for the round trip in the rest frame, S prime the, of, of the ruler, the round trip then is, becomes this. So we have 2 times L0 over C. So that's, that's our expression for the reference, for the time that it took for that. That's going to be equal to, and then we just used our formula from the time dilation, the time change, and then we to get our expression to relate the two together. So doing that, then, um, we're going to get the following equation. OK, so we've got our. Delta T naught, we can relate it to delta T, which we saw for here. So we found the two. So then delta T naught is equal to gamma times delta T. Or we can just have it that um, we know what delta T naught is, 2L0 over C in this particular problem. And then so that's going to be equal to delta T times this gamma factor. So 1 minus u squared over c squared. OK, simple enough. But then this gives us a way to combine for the lengths of L and L0, because we have an expression that ex describes L in terms of delta t. So we have delta t described in terms of L. And we also have it described in terms of L0. So we can relate L to L0. So we have that the length of 1, the length of it in one frame of reference, is going to be, um, going to be this. It's going to be related to L0 by this gamma factor. So 1 minus u squared over c squared. So it turns out that in, for the length going this way, they don't agree 
on what the lengths are. So it's not an optical illusion. The ruler really is shorter in reference frame S than it is in S prime. A length measured in the frame in which the object is at rest is called the proper length. Thus, L0 is a proper length in S, and the length measured in any other frame moving relative to S prime is less than L0. So this effect is called length contraction. When U is very small compared to C, gamma approaches 1. So you aren't going to see this in normal speeds. You're only going to see it going really fast. Um, if U is a reasonable fraction of C, the quantity can be appreciably less than 1. Then L can be subsp substantially smaller than L0. And the effects of length contraction are significant. So here's an example. We've got these uh, electrons particle accelerators, and they're traveling at slack near Stanford. So they're only going by slower than the speed of light uh, by 10 centimeters per second. As measured in the reference frame of such an electron, the beam line, which extends from the top of this photograph, is only 8 centimeters long. <laughs> so in the reference frame of the electron, it goes a tiny distance. So you can see here that space travel, if we actually ever do have space travel, it's going to be pretty strange because uh, like at, at relativistic speeds, I should say, we have space travel, but like not just to like the moon or like Mars if it takes like years. We're talking about like if we're going fast like these electrons, it's going to be very strange because we're not just going to have changing times, but we're also going to have, we can't agree on how far something was that we traveled. <laughs> so the electron thinks it only traveled eight centimeters, when you can see here, this picture doesn't even cover the whole distance that it travels. This is miles, at least a couple miles, it looks like, at least a mile. OK, so this equation that we derived here is for lengths measured in the direction parallel to the relative motion of two frames of reference. There's also lengths that are measured perpendicular to the direction of motion, and they're not contracted. So what that means is, remember that the shape of an object has to do with its measurements in three directions, and it has a volume. So that means that when you have this, this contraction, Objects don't maintain their same volume even. So when you look at somebody and they're traveling at a relativistic speed, they're going to look, they're going to look squished, right, or something. They're going, to, they're, they're, they're going to have a different shape to them. They're going to appear their volume isn't going to be preserved. So we have a relativity of volume. But that's kind of weird because then we have a relativity of density because density is mass per unit volume. So how do we reconcile that? OK, so that's something to, that's something to think about a little bit. Um, lengths that are measured perpendicular to the direction are not contracted. Consider two identical meter sticks. One stick is at rest in frame S and lies along the positive y-axis with one end at O, the origin of S. The other is at rest in frame S prime and lies along the positive y-axis with one end at O prime, the origin of S prime. Frame S prime moves in the positive x direction relative to frame S. Observers Stanley and Mavis, at rest in S and S prime respectively, station themselves at the 50 centimeter mark of their sticks. At the instant the two origins coincide, the two sticks lie along the same line. So at this instant, Mavis makes a mark on Stanley's stick at the point that coincides with her own 50 centimeter mark and Stanley does the same to Mavis's. So for the sake of argument, assume that Stanley observes Mavis's stick as longer than his own. Then the mark Stanley makes on her stick is below its center. OK, let's see if we can get a picture here to actually illustrate this. OK, so here we go. So we're looking at lengths. Now we're looking at lengths going in this direction. The meter sticks are perpendicular to the relative velocity 
For any value of u, both Stanley and Mavis measure either stick to have a length of one meter. Because the moving rod of length L0, it makes this angle theta naught with the direction of relative motion, this direction here. Um, L0 cosine theta 0 is contracted. However, its length component perpendicular to the motion is not that. It's L sine theta 0, which remains the same. So it has to do with the fact that we have this relative speed u here. This is why the length contraction doesn't um, affect the perpendicular motion. We can show it with this complicated geometrical thought experiment. But the simplest way to see it is, well, the, this u applies to just the x direction, because that's the only direction that the motion is occurring in. So since there's no change in y and z, y and z have the, the relative motion in those frames is the same for Stanley and Mavis, right? There's no, there's no change in y or z. She's not flying up and going different ways. If she was, then yes, length contraction would be occurring in those directions as well. But since there's not, it's just along x, there's no length contraction in those other directions. And you can see it simply from, from this formula. It's quite, quite easy to see that. Because we've got like u is only in the x direction, not in the y or z. So that's the way that I would remember that. It's, it's actually pretty simple, pretty straightforward for that one. OK, so um, we'll do this example uh, next class on Tuesday. I think what we'll do is we'll finish up with relativity on Tuesday. And then next Thursday, we're going to have like a big review session where we pull everything together. And then I'll do like a final thing. And I think we have a quiz next Thursday, right? I believe so. Double check the double check the syllabus.